So tonight, in our seminar series, we're having the Donut Economics, or Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, uh, by Dr. Kate Rollworth. Um, before we start and head back to her, I'll just introduce our guest for tonight. Uh, so Kate Rollworth is an ecological economist and creator of the Donut, a concept that aims to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet, and co-founder of Donut Economics, an action lab, and her internationally uh, best-selling book, Donut Economics, has been translated into over 20 languages and has been widely influential with diverse audiences, from the UN General Assembly and Pope Francis to Extinction Rebellion. Kate is a senior associate at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute, where she teaches on Masters in Environmental Change and Management. She's also a professor of practice at Amsterdam University of Applied Science. Over the 25 past years, uh, Kate's career has taken her from working with micro-entrepreneurs in the villages of Zanzibar to co-authoring the Human Development Report for the UNDP in New York followed by a decade as a senior researcher at Oxfam. She holds a first-class BA in politics, philosophy, and economics, uh, a master in economics for development, both from U Oxford University. She's also a member of the Club of Rome and currently serves as on the World Health Organization Council on the Economics of Health for All. Kate has written extensively for media, including The Guardian, The New Statesman, New Newsweek, Wired, and has contributed to many radio programs, including BBC Radio 4 and the World Service, ABC and NPR, as well as television, including CNN World News, Al Jazeera, BBC, ITV, and CBC. So we'll be having Kate talking to us uh, for 50 minutes, then we'll be opening for questions for the audience, okay? Thank you very much, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. So I'm really into distributive design, so let's make the most of the resources in this room. If you can see empty seats, can you move inwards so that all the folks at the back who can't sit down can find a place at the end? So everybody move inwards if there's an empty seat near you, and then there'll be places for everyone to sit down. Thank you. There's one here in the front. There's one there at the end. Lots over here. More seats. There's even seats here. <laughs> we can move these ones over there. Yeah. Cool. There's probably against the fire. There's one here in the front if anybody wants. There's several here. Okay, thank you. It's lovely to be here. I'm going to jump in. Um, the reason I'm here is because of those degrees that uh, Ingrid just mentioned. I studied economics at Oxford University over 30 years ago. I'm 53. So when I was in my early 20s, I studied economics, I wanted to help change the world, economics is the mother tongue of public policy, it's going to equip me, right? Uh, didn't, I got frustrated, I did development economics, made a lot more sense and left me thinking, why isn't that just economics? Like, let's, shouldn't all economics start with a march Sen? Why would you not start with a march Sen? Uh, but I walked away from economics frustrated, um, I never wanted to say, hello, I'm an economist, right? I don't know if anyone else has that feeling, but just like... Uh, so I just left myself with no discipline, and I spent three years working in Zanzibar, uh, an ODI fellow, if that means anything to some folks. I spent four years working on the Human Development Report in New York at the UN. I moved back to the UK. I worked for Oxfam for 11 years. I became a mother of twins, so immersed in the unpaid care economy of nappies and babies. I really understood gender and technology politics, like you don't get it until you're in it. And then there was a global financial crash. And all the economists started saying, oh, perhaps we should rewrite economics to uh, 
so that it uh, reflects financial realities. And I thought, well, I'll be damned if we're only going to re re rewrite it for financial realities. What about all the social and ecological realities that have always been excluded from economics? And that's what drew me back towards it. And I drew this donut diagram that had way more traction than I ever imagined it would. And I thought, hang on, there's a lot of appetite for rewriting economics here. So that's what brought me back into this. And that's why I'm here today. Um, and I'm going to start with the power of pictures. I see there's some pictures, there's some equations, there's some pictures here. I kind of like that. Uh, I've got no equations for you. The only numbers in my book are the page numbers, so nobody's intimidated by that. Uh, let's start with pictures. Pictures, pictures are really, really powerful. Universities teach us either to focus on maths and numbers or words, and we get super hyper-analytical and critical about meanings of words, contested words. We think pictures are illustrations. They are not mere illustrations. They go into our eyes. They go right through into the back of our head, sit in your visual cortex, and can stay there for decades, for a lifetime. You don't even know it's there, and it's shaping the way you think. But it is. It's shaping what you put at the center and what you leave at periphery, what you make visible, what's left invisible, and it changes everything. And these guys knew it, right? Ptolemy, back in Alexandria, he drew this map thousands of years ago of the known universe with Earth at the center and all the planets around it. And in the 1500s, Copernicus was sitting there with his telescope and he was looking at the sky and he knew Ptolemy had got it all wrong. It didn't work like this. But Copernicus did not dare publish his own map, his picture, until he was on his deathbed. Because he knew that what he had up his sleeve, up his little red sleeve, was revolutionary. He had put the sun, not the earth, at the centre of the known universe. And the earth is just a sort of incidental planet going round. And that deeply challenged the power of the church, upended our sense of who we are in the universe, challenged papal orthodoxy. I mean, this was revolutionary. So rearranging a few concentric circles can be revolutionary. Pictures matter. They are, I think, foundational to the models that we make. And so we should always pay attention to the pictures that we draw, that we teach, that we learn, that we pass on. So what are the pictures of 20th century economics? And I say 20th century economics, I'm talking very broadly about what I consider still actually is mainstream economics, still taught in many universities. And I'll be curious about how much it's taught to those of you here who've studied economics. So let's just, who here has ever studied economics of any kind, whether it's A-level or G? Okay, lots of you, great. Okay, so what's the first diagram you remember learning? Do you know that is the same answer the world over? I can't think of any other single discipline where you could ask that question and get that unison answer from every single student. It's really quite weird. And if you think about it, economics, the art of household management, that's what it means. Welcome to the art of household management, here's supply and demand. I mean, and, and that is a really political act. Because it goes, here is economics. What a noble art to manage our planetary household in the interest of all her inhabitants. Here's the market. So right day one, bang, we're in the market. Well, that's just, I mean, that's a particular place to start. And price, price is suddenly right there at the cross. It's monetary value that is at the center of our concern. And if things fall outside of the market contract, they're not reflected in market value, they're called... Well, there's a thing. It's kind of like out there, right? This framing, this is a very visual language of framing. I think it has huge repercussions. So we start 20th century economics. The starting point is that, or the big picture even of the economy, it's the circular flow of goods and money. It's the market relationship. There we are. We started with supply and demand. Money and resources going round and round between households and businesses. Yes, some leaks out through banks, through governments, through trade. There's a lot wrong with this. In fact, when the economists said we need to make economics reflect financial reality, the big thing they were talking about was that actually banks don't take your savings and turn it into investment. They're not this little, little you know, nice balancing act. They create money as debt-bearing interest. They are a pump. That was what they wanted to fix. Needs fixing, but there's a hell of a lot else going wrong in this diagram. Very quickly, governments don't only turn taxes into spending. Governments like this one, any government with a sovereign currency, can create money and spend it into existence. But also, 
there's absolutely no mention of energy here, no mention of resources, of Earth's material. Where is the stuff coming from and where is the waste going to? It's not a circular flow. There's no mention of the unpaid caring work that gets labour fresh and ready for work every day. Pre hey, presto, ready, clean, fed, well-slept, children raised, labour is reproduced, missing. There's no mention of the commons. So some of the fundamental sources of our well-being are just completely absent from this diagram. But it's the starting point, and it underpins most macroeconomic models still today. The self-portrait is of rational economic man. I drew a little picture of him. He's, he's that guy at the top. He's probably a guy. Standing alone. He's got money in his hand, ego in his heart, calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. He hates work. He loves luxury. He knows the price of everything. And the biggest problem with this character is not how absurdly narrow that portrait is, is the real problem is what looking at him does to us. Because research has shown by people like Robert Frank that the more that students learn about rational economic man from year one to two to three of their studies, the more they value his traits, the more students value competition over collaboration, self-interest over altruism. So the models we make of ourselves remake us and who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. This is not just an economics problem, this is a problem or an issue for every single discipline that claims to tell us who we are. It's performative. It matters who we tell ourselves we are. And then there's the goal. And the goal of economics, I mean, any mainstream economist tell economics, there's never a goal, it's a science. Don't be so normative. It's a science. We're objective here. Well, there's a goal in every single economist's advice and every politician's speech, and it is, of course, growth. Growth endlessly. No matter how rich a nation already is, like this one, we're in one of the richest countries ever in the history of humanity, and yet we have the Labour Party and the Conservative Party saying growth, growth, growth. This is the best vision we can apparently offer in the run-up to an election. So growth endlessly. To me, these diagrams profoundly damage our minds and they damage our chances of reshaping the future. They are such an inadequate beginning for an economics education today. So, oh yeah, this is the bit that really gets me. I mean, this alone is reason enough to start again, right? If you say to an economist, right, you've already told me externality, so, oh, where does chemical pollution show up? Climate change, where, do, where does it show up in the models? Well, in a, in a macro model... The best thing we can say, well, you know, labor and capital, kind of land is a kind of capital, land is kind of nature. Okay, so the whole of the living world is there in that word capital, if you choose to bother to recognize that it's maybe have these other kinds of capital, it's there inside the model. And over here, it's that red wedge. It's the gap between the social cost and the private cost, and that's the kind of the pollution gloop. I really honestly think that if aliens wanted to destroy human life on Earth, they would merely need to convince us, uh, us to depict our relationship with the living world like this and job done. They don't need to come here, no lasers. This, this is enough because humanity does not stand a chance of learning to live as part of this planet and thrive as part of this planet if this is how in economics we tell ourselves we depict the living world. It's insane. So for me, this is the motivation to start all over again. And there's good company. Our dear friend John Maynard Keynes. It's always helpful when you can quote Keynes, you know, it's like you're on home turf of the economics. <laughs> economics is the science of thinking in terms of models. Yes, look, some lovely models. Let's be really scientific about this. But we need to choose models which are relevant to the contemporary world. And I think right now is a time where we should focus more on the bottom half before we get on with the top half. We jump too much and the textbooks are written too much about the top half of that quote. It's time to rethink for models that are relevant to the contemporary world because what we know now is totally different from what Keynes knew or Friedman knew or those just decades ago. This is a different reality. We need new models that actually do justice to this. And then we can go to... Buckminster Fuller, you never change things by fighting the existing reality, right? You change things by building a new model that makes the existing one obsolete. So for me, this was a really important motivation in writing Donut Economics. I'd noticed that I'd spent years, and many other economists have spent years, heterodox economics, attacking and critiquing the mainstream and all the things that are wrong with it, and I kind of did that just now in one slide. 
if we keep just attacking the old model, we're just still talking about the old model. And we have these little caveats on and we go down the caveats. Anyway, yes, caveats, but let's carry on anyway. No, let's not carry on anyway. Let's start again with something that actually serves us. So I'm much more into proposition than critique. It's more interesting. It's harder, by the way, to be propositional. But I really encourage you, as, a, as a, just a principle, be propositional. Be critical, but then be propositional. Okay, then what instead? So let's be propositional. And that's why I love this uh, website by Exploring Economics, uh, part of the Rethinking Economics movement. Students in Germany created this model, this website. And it, what it does is just a really nice laying out of recognition that there are many, many different schools of thought in economics. Um, and I think, so a pluralist, a, a pluralist education or a pluralist call would say, teach us all of these schools of thought so that we know that they all exist. First, let us know they exist. Teach us the basics of them. And then trust my critical reasoning to decide which one is the one I want to use as my worldview or which one is most useful at a time. Brilliant call by Rethinking Economics, because how do you resist that? How do you say, no, 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 we're just going to keep you here in this box. Nothing to see here. Nothing over there. Just stay in this one box. It's, it's unreasonable. I'm not going to be pluralist here. I'm going to actually take a position. And in Donut Economics, I essentially say, let's start kind of here, ecological economics, complexity, feminist. Let's learn from Marx, some evolutionary institutional. So Donut Economics is a bit of a mashup of this side, okay? That's, and I, was, I wrote it because I turned to all the economics I had never been taught and found amazing ideas, and I thought, well, I don't want them in their separate boxes. Oh, you're going to a feminist economics conference. I'm going to an ecological economics conference, and she's gone to a complexity economics conference. We need to bring them together and make them dance on the same page. I really recommend this website if you want to say, I, I want to know the basic concepts of each of these. They've done a beautiful job of laying it out, so I really recommend so in Donut Economics, I brought those schools of thought together and set it out as seven ways to think. Moving from the old, let's recognize where we're coming from and the mindset we've inherited and a proposition of where we want to get to. So that's what I did in this book. And I've spent the last, uh, since 2017, gosh, nearly seven years now, um, responding to the fact, the amazing, thrilling fact that teachers get in touch or communities or businesses or mayors and councillors get in touch and say, we will want to do this. We're actually going to put this into practice. So that's what Donut Economics Action Lab is, and that's why we exist, to work with change makers who want to make this happen. So I'm going to tell you some of the theory here, and then I'm going to land in, here's some examples just from the world of cities and practice of what it means to try and put new economic thinking into practice in the midst of a system that doesn't really want to change. So here's the donut, right? We were saying, you know, did we bring some donuts? If you came hoping for actual donuts, I'm really sorry to disappoint you. The best ones are conceptual. You don't have to put any calories, but they can help change your mind. So it's, think of it as a compass. So this, I'm starting with the goal, by the way, as opposed to mainstream economics, which never draws the goal, but it's tacit under everything. I think we should put our hearts on our sleeves. What are you here for? Why, why are we here? What's the goal of economics? If we don't know what the goal is, how the hell do we know whether it's going well or not? How do we judge any policy, any measure? So for me, this is a statement, a proposition of a goal. To meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. Leave no one falling short in the hole in the middle. Those come from the sustainable development goal. So all the world's governments have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meet those essentials. But as we seek to meet our needs and our wants, and oh so many wants there are, we put pressure on the planet and therefore we overshoot the ecological ceiling and put pressure on these life-supporting systems, the nine planetary boundaries. So it's made up, really, of the sustainable development goals in the middle, the planetary boundaries on the outside. And the green space in between is that safe and just space, a minimally safe ecologically, a minimally just, because no one is left falling short on life's essentials. Already the shape of progress has completely transformed. Right? The, 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 the one we've inherited, the one our, our politicians still speak to, is this shape of progress, endless growth. And it doesn't just stop with my hand. It's an, expansion, an exponential curve, so it goes right through that ceiling pretty quickly. And nobody wants to ask what happens when we get there, but it just keeps going. This is a, a different shape of progress, right? It's between the boundaries. It's a Goldilocks zone. And if, if, if anyone's a medic, it's like, well, this looks quite like a heartbeat. And in our bodies, we already understand that health lies in balance. That's what keeps us alive. That's what amazingly has all of our bodies at about the same temperature right now. Because our bodies are continually balancing food and warmth, 
water, hydration. We stay alive because we thrive on balance, not endless growth. You grow, but then you grow up. I think we can learn a lot from bodily health to planetary health. If anybody wants a seat, there's one plum little chair right here in the middle. You're very welcome. So, if that's the goal. I was really blown away when I first published this. With, it was like a discussion paper published by Oxfam in 2012. We're just like, oh, here's an idea. And so many people responded to it. So I then, it was through that that I learned the power of pictures. Wow, so many people are motivated, empowered, mobilized just by having a new diagram. And it made me start looking at how other cultures, non-Western cultures, have for a long time depicted their vision or their diagram or visualization of well-being, of thriving, of health, of wealth. And I was just blown away that across the world, in so many different cultural contexts, again and again, this, the image are, is of a, a circle, but with a dynamism within it. So there's something very deep that people from many different cultures for millennia have picked up on this sense of dynamism within a circle. And the donut's just tapping into something that's been long, long, long known in other cultures. So I now tend to think of it as a bit of a bridge between this Western economic mindset that's taught not only in the West but actually worldwide. Between, is, it, is it a bridge? Can we, can we have like a Western mindset recovery program? I think of the donut as a medication along the way, you know. Can we find our way back towards a wisdom that's long been held in other cultural traditions? So that's the way I see it. If balance is the goal, we are very far from that right now, as all the red here shows. Billions of people worldwide falling short on life's essentials. Those are measured sometimes with one metric, sometimes with two. That's why it's a bit staggered in place, just a couple of indicators. But also in ecological overshoot, having overshot at least six of the nine planetary boundaries. So this is, this is our selfie. I mean, if we want a selfie of who we are, this is, this is humanity right now. And I really think uh, my kids, my kids already ask me, they're 15. Your kids, your children's children will literally pull on our sleeves and say, and what did you do once that you knew? Once you saw this, once you understood this reality, what did you do in your life, in how you worked, how you studied, how you taught? how you made your money, how you saved your money, how you voted, you volunteered, you invested, divested, you protested. What did you do to help turn this story around? What could each of us do? We see it every day in the headlines, and I think one of our big psychological challenges is to stay alive to it, even though we can get inured by these headlines. Another hurricane, another flood, another drought. How do we stay alive and not overwhelmed by that, and actually be in action about transforming it. I'm showing you a global picture, and most action happens closer to home. So let's bring this down. My colleague Andrew Fanning and several others uh, created a brilliant database of 150 nations. If you want to see yours, you can go to this website. And they've got a lot of data there. But here's just four nations. So Malawi, on average income, $1,500 per person per year. Massive human shortfall, not overshooting their share of planetary boundaries. China, a double whammy challenge. The UK, since we're here. Inequality, that feels familiar. And significant ecological overshoot. United States, even greater inequality. We, we, we know what that, right? We can all see that showing up in the US. Massive ecological overshoot. And let me just say that the red overshoot, it's not measured in a production basis. It's not just the carbon emissions and the material footprint in the country. It's consumption based. So it's all of the emissions that have been imported from elsewhere. I mean, just look at this room, all the clothes we're wearing, the food we've eaten, the laptops everyone's got, the lights, the, the carpets. This stuff was not made in the UK. So what's enabling us to live well right now in this room is materials from all over the world. That's incorporated in the UK's overshoot. So there's four nations. Let's now put it into a scatter plot. There's around 50, just a selection of countries. The place where every nation should be aiming to be is that little green donut in the top left-hand corner because we rise up to meet the needs of all people, but we come back within the means of the living planet. So the first thing you can notice here is there's not a single country that's there yet. Costa Rica is closer than any other. And I invite you next time you catch yourself or somebody else talking about developed countries, you can say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, what do you mean? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Because there's not a single country here that should be calling itself developed. And definitely not the high-income countries. There's absolutely nothing developed 
about overshooting planetary boundaries so that you destroy the life support systems of our planetary home and utterly undermine the possibility of these kinds of nations of ever rising up and meeting their needs. So I invite you to take out developed countries from your vocabulary. I just talk about high, middle and low income countries just to be factual about it. So let's also recognise that although these countries stand like little separated scattered plots on the, on the page, they are, of course, profoundly interconnected from histories of colonialism all the way through to current and future impacts of climate change, predominantly power relations from the global north upon the global south. So they are interconnected. And it will be, I would love to make a visualisation that brings out more and more of those interconnections. For me, this is where data visualisation needs to be going next, is showing the relations between and the interconnections of place. Okay, so the history of pursuing growth, that thing our politicians love so much, has generally taken nations in this direction. And, and let's acknowledge, if you're in Malawi on $1,500 per person, when you double that national income, it's massive. It's massive in terms of child survival and nutrition and girls' education and women's opportunity and the fundamentals of life. It can have massive impacts on getting people out of the hole in the middle of the donut. And, and again, from 3 to 6 and 6 to 12... But as you go higher and higher in income, countries generally have not converted it into meeting the needs of all without overshooting the planet. They go straight past that sweet point into ecological overshoot. So the history of pursuing growth has taken us broadly in this direction. Can we transform that? Can we instead have a, an utterly different future, change the dynamic that would take us somewhere else so that these lower income countries, we've got Malawi, Mozambique, Kenya... Cameroon, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, can these countries rise up and meet the needs of all without overshooting the means of the planet in the way that most nations before them have done? That's an unprecedented journey. What would it take? Is it possible? Is it reasonable to ask? A lot of really interesting technological, political, ethical questions around, is that a desirable trajectory? What if middle-income countries, we've got uh, Turkey, Russia, Iran, China, Mexico, major emerging economies here that are laying down massive infrastructure, currently moving straight past that spot. Could they reorient 90 degrees and head towards it? What would it mean? What kinds of changes of policy and infrastructure would actually take them in a very different direction? And can the high-income nations, those massive overshooters and that red glaring out from the page, can they massively reduce their ecological overshoot while finally meeting the needs of all of their people because they certainly have the resources to do so? That's also an unprecedented journey. So there's nothing easy about any of this for any of these nations. They all have different kinds of lock-ins and challenges. And for then for this to happen, I believe it's going to call for a huge rebalancing in the world and that rebalancing bring there the specificity of what that means for you is it reparations is it redistribution of wealth and how is it through technology is it through financial transfers is it a rebalance of power in international financial institutions in the g20 what kind of rebalancing is going to be required that enables those countries to rise and others to reduce at the same time for me, this has become my sort of uber map of account for any policy, any proposition. Is it, is it helping to take us in this direction? It also can be quite overwhelming because you can think, is that feasible? Or it can be very motivating. It's like at last we actually have a map of what we're trying to do and a starting point of where we want to get to. So we could spend the rest of our time together sitting on this. And if anybody wants to come back to it, I invite you to bring us back to it later. I'm going to take it as a starting point of saying, if that's the goal, if that's the directional goal we want to travel in, what kind of mindset, I'm going to come back to the mindset, what kind of mindset would we seek to equip ourselves with and rising generations of students, of, of the economists and beyond, the economists and the practitioners of this century who, you know, by the time you're my age, by the time you're 53, it'll be your generation holding the institutions and being the, you know, when the Prime Minister's sort of younger than you, that kind of moment, they'll be, you know, and, and it'll be your generation. In, in, and what mindset will they have brought? What mindset will all of your generation be bringing to this challenge? So I want to go back and start again. And I think we will start, again, what's the first diagram you show? And it's not going to be supply and demand. 
For me, it starts here, and I call this the embedded economy diagram. So for me, the first diagram should be the biggest. We need to see the whole, right? And so this is systems thinking. You need to see the whole and recognize the parts within a bigger system. Look up a level. Always look up a level and look down a level if you really want to have some kind of mastery of the system that you're concerned with. So this blends ecological economics with feminist economics and commons theory, bringing it into one diagram. What have we got going on? We've got the economy is a subset of society. The economy is an entirely human construct, even, even the fact that we call it the economy. Right? Many sociologists would say, well, where did this thing, the economy, come about? It's quite a new framing that it, there's a thing called the economy, that everything is protecting. And the economy is an entirely human construct. It's the way in which we provision for our needs and wants. It is a subset of social relations. And it depends upon other social systems on our political, social, cultural, legal media, many other systems that shape and frame this economy. There's never such a thing as a free market. It's always shaped by cultural and legal regulation. And that human society is a subset of the living world. We are part of nature, utterly dependent upon it, held within it, and dependent upon the healthy functioning, stable climate, biodiversity, water, clean air, the healthy functioning that those planetary boundaries seek to protect. What you notice is that in this diagram, compared to the old, the first one I showed you, the circular flow, in the circular flow diagram, all the arrows were showing you money flowing round and goods flowing round. They were all human product. This diagram shows you energy, so the solar energy coming in, from which all life comes, without the sun. Right? I should probably just draw the sun here. But the energy coming in and the waste heat bouncing out. That's where all, yeah, everything that's ever been made is made with energy. And I think energy is massively missing from economics. It should be the fundamental currency of economics, not money. Energy is fundamental. Money is invented and it, its value is not constant. It's, it's a illusioner, illusionary. Energy is not an illusion. There's laws of thermodynamics and we can't muck around with them. They are like the foundation of the universe. So I think if 21st century economics is going to succeed, I predict it will move much more to energy-based accounting. And the physicists will come in and say, ah, oh, now you need us. Now you want to talk about thermodynamics. But also we've got the, the economy drawing in matter and materials from the living world, drawing in and putting out waste. And so it really matters how much material, where is it coming from and how is it disrupting the balance of biodiversity, of forests, of the oceans, and where is that waste going, and how is that disrupting the balance of the atmosphere? So how we use materials impacts upon the bigger system of which all life depends, which is the stability of life on Earth. To me, putting the economy inside the living world is not a nice add-on. Oh, I think I'll do a bit of eco ecological economics as a third-year option. It should be, in my mind, the foundation of every macro model. In fact, I would, I, would, I would argue with any professor, how can you not, how can you not recognize that the, all economic modeling is a subset of this and has consequences for energy use, the climate, and for stability of life on Earth? Because the scale of humanity in the Anthropocene means we have to move up to this scale. To me, it makes no sense to do macroeconomic model that does not recognize its subset of the living world. So, but also let's look inside the economy, right? Now when we go in, I think it's really important to recognize there are many different ways we provision for our needs and wants. So as we know, mainstream economics goes, welcome to economics, here's the market, and then we play around with the market, and then we generally go, well, but markets don't always, you know, they don't always provide because they've got some caveats, they've got externalities, so we might need the state. And then we play around the state and go, well, but the state might fail. We might have state failure. So you've got this kind of market-state dichotomy. And the, the story of 20th century economics is basically across the horizontal there. Are you a free market laissez-faire capitalist or you're a state-loving socialist? And let's have a, you know, let's have a standoff between the two. And that, the obsession of that ideological boxing match means that economics, mainstream economics, just missed two other fundamental forms of provisioning. A household where we begin every day, except when we're a student because we're not living at home, which is a really ironic moment to be pulled out of the household because you're, you know, if you're immersed in it when you've got kids or when you are a parent, you're, you're, you're just can't miss it. Your time budget, your caring responsibilities, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, it's essential and it reproduces life 
for thanks to all your parents for all the work they did to enable you to be here at this point in life. And, and the caring responsibilities will come. I'm, I'm in a family sandwich between my children and my parents and that double-ended care, you really, really feel it. But also the commons, where we come together, not as a market or state, but as a community, and we co-produce goods and services we value. So for me, all of these re deserve recognition from day one. So let's give them names. You know, we, we know this, right? Even if you might not have studied this in economics, you know it in life, because we all move through all of these, right? In the space of the market, every day we are a consumer. We buy stuff, or you sell things. And Karl Marx is really useful in reminding us that in the space of production, are you a laborer getting a wage or a capital owner getting the profit? Pretty critical difference. Or are you destitute and excluded from market-based relations because you don't have money and can't access pur purchasing goods? In the space of the market, uh, sorry, the state, a resident of a place using public services, or are you a public, uh, public servant? Are you a voter, a protester, a regulator, or are you stateless and excluded from public provisioning? the space of the household, the parent, partner, relative, child, or are you kinless and excluded from household care and relations? In the space of the commons, are you a commoner or a steward, a co-creator, a volunteer, or excluded from those commons? So we all weave these together. I mean, I bet today you've probably been through all of them in some respect, but we don't normally name them, and I think it's important to name them, recognise we know how to move through them. You know, if if somebody, I don't know, if Naomi invited me for supper and had a lovely meal at her house and at the end of the meal I kind of got out my wallet and said, that was lovely, how much do I owe you? It's like, that's rude. You just mixed up the household gift economy with the market. What's wrong with you? You should know. These, they, you know, we know when we're in one space and we know when we're in the other space and it's taboo to blur them. So we know how to use these and we know the values and the different qualities and attributes are expected when we're in them. And of course there's finance, right? Are you a creditor, a debtor, an investor, a speculator, or financially excluded? So we can, everybody has a story, in fact. If, you know, if we have more time, I say, tell your neighbor your story in relation to these. Where are you at in your life? Which roles are you playing right now? And what's the history of the roles you've played or history of your family's roles? Because we have different stories in relation to this. This space of market and finance is very dominated by, ah, oh, when we're in market relations and finance, yes, we should be rational, economic, man, self-interest, competition, right? It, this character has really dominated this space. But actually, in the other spaces, the values and the behaviors and attributes that are, are desired and admired are much more reciprocity, communal, collective, the whole, the community. And many people out of COVID said when market spaces got closed down for physical distancing and much more went into the state, household and commons, a lot of people said after us, the one thing we don't want to lose is that bigger sense of a we, that we found ourselves using these different kinds of relations more. Can we create an economy that actually that stays with us, not just in a pandemic? Let's just dive into each one. So markets, many, many kinds of markets, from a street market, tiny stallholder to a mega supermarket, cooperatives and markets as a corporation. So there's many different kinds of forms within the market space. I'm definitely not saying market bad, right? Market's an amazing, amazing mechanism. Adam Smith was onto something when he admired the power of the market to distribute goods and services through the price mechanism as if it was an invisible hand. But markets are incredible. They have a couple of caveats. They only serve those who can pay and the rest they ignore. And they only value what's priced, the rest they exploit. Those are massive caveats. Those are caveats for externalities, the second one, but the first one, distributional questions. And so there's a massive reason to say, I don't want an economy that only uses the market as an organizing form for provisioning. So let's go to the state. Nope, let's go to care. Let's go to household. So I love this diagram. This is the cover of a book by Nancy Frolbray, which is called Who Pays for the Kids? And you can think of it as a very 1950s picture. Think of it, 1950s UK, right? Though In the morning, off goes the husband. It was the husband. Goes off to the factory, does his day's work, productive economy. At the end of the day, comes out the factory. Look, he gets the wage. You see the guy with his little wage packet? He gets the wage. That matters. Comes home, and his wife cares for him, and she washes his clothes, and she makes his dinner, and she tends to him if he's sick, and she raises the kids, by the way. And This is, this is her getting labor fresh and ready for the factory gate the next morning. These two systems of productive economy and reproductive care economy are utterly interdependent, but only one of them gets paid. And therein you get household gender dynamics of who's got the money and who's doing the reproductive work. So to me, this is essential to recognize. Let's recognize it still continues today. 
And of course, men and women are both involved. So the gender, the gender stereotype of this has softened in many contexts and, it, and has become much more normalized in different ways. But care, we still seek to ensure recognition of its importance because it's not taught in mainstream economic, it's just left out. The time, oh, the time. Reduction of it through labor-saving devices, these women carrying water on their heads, right? I mean, you can think of so many different ways that they could not spend three hours a day merely carrying water and firewood backward and forward. If they had a tap, a well, a barrel with water in it. Redistributing it between members of a family, so the political question of and who does the washing up at home and who does the laundry and who cares for the kids at the weekend. And representation in decision-making spaces. So ensuring that these voices are able to attend meetings and able to be heard so that it's taken into account. So the importance of taking account of care has come to the commons. I love this diagram because the, the cloth that is woven here is only feasible, only possible because of all the people holding the many threads. It's a collectively created uh, value. Whether it's the Wikipedia or the community garden or open source fab lab or the atmosphere, these are all commons. And in the words of David Bollier, if you want to know if something's a commons, as he said, you know, you have to look for, yeah, there's a resource, you're looking for a shared resource, but you've also got to find a community, a defined community, and rules and norms that they're following. A commons is not just a piece of waste ground. That is not a commons, that's a piece of waste ground. As he says, if you, there's no commons without commoning. A community who are following a shared set of rules and norms, better or worse, quite well followed on Wikipedia, really badly followed on the atmosphere, but these are both commons, better or worse stewarded. So the potential for the commons. And then the state, the state which provides lighting and traffic lights and car lanes or bike lanes and buses and trees, vaccines. The state not only provides public goods, but also has a particular role, obviously, which is it manages the relation between, through regulation and subsidy, the state provides public goods, but also enables households, role for care, unleashes the commons, and embeds markets in rules. So the state has a responsibility not only to provide, but to enable the rest to provide well. Last one, let's just go to finance. And just let's recognize that there's many, many, many kinds of money. Many kinds. Some of it's created by the state as fiat money. A lot of it's created by banks as credit. And that's what the financial crash kind of, oh, let's put that in our models, okay? Some of it's created by communities as community currency. Some of it's created by households. Anybody here, when you were a kid, did your parents like give you tokens or reward stickers or anything? Put your hand up if you did. Yeah, okay. So that's a household currency. I tried that when my twins were two and a half. I said, if you pee on the potty, I'll give you a sticker. And my daughter took one look at me. She sat on the potty and she went, psst, psst. She did six little peas and she said, six stickers, mummy. I was like, that is the end of household currency. She gained it right from day one. But we create currencies in our households. So many kinds of money, and it's shaped by who has the power to create money, right? Or money, you can ask, who has the power to create this money? What character does it bear? Does it, does it bear interest or demerge where it loses value over time instead of gains it? And what can it be used for? And these three design characteristics of money shape Distribution, they shape behavior, and they shape outcomes. Hugely powerful design of money. Right, let me pull back out of here. And let's just recognize in this space that all four of these forms can provision for so many things. We got, I think we live in a society that's so dominated by markets and a little bit of state that we don't recognize the other potentials. So all four forms produce food. It's happening all the time. People figure it out. All produced with different rules and norms of how we do this, because if we're in the market, it's different from the state, different from the household and the commons, but it's happening everywhere. They all produce energy. And thanks, and this is an interesting one, technology has transformed this, right? 20th century, energy was either an oil rig or a gas pipeline or a coal mine, so it was massive capital brought together. Only the big market corporate or the state could do that, so it was dominated across the horizon. But now technology has given us small panels, single turbines, you get the vertical too. Households can be energy generators. Communities can be energy generators. Transforms ownership and power. They all build houses. They all steward forests. And they all create money. So I just think it's really useful to open our minds up and recognize there are so many different ways of provisioning. And they will have very different distributional, political consequences of which ones we make work. 
And what do our politics lean towards? In this country, we've had decades of privatization that have just put us so much in the market. Can we return and enable more state, more commons, more household, different forms of provisioning? OK, last one on this. Really important, obviously, is some of the most interesting stuff happens across the boundaries, whether it's households and state with a, the state funding household insulation or heat pump installation, whether it's prosumers through solar microgrids, households acting in the market, whether it's open source software that you have open source software, but you build your own enterprise on top of that, or whether it's through community land ownership. So many, many, many more, but a lot of the most interesting things happen. And I think a lot of the most interesting innovations that are coming in the future happen at the conjunction of these. So if we ignore market state household commons, we're, we're missing out on some of the most dynamic spaces of organizing in our economies. So that was, that was all from the embedded economy diagram, a new first big picture, and it changes everything. But also, let's recognize this diagram tells us this is a world that is extremely unequal. There's billions of people who can't meet their basic needs, and we've collectively overshot our pressure on the planet because of excessive consumption. So it's a deeply divided world. It's also a deeply degenerative world. We are literally destroying Earth's life-supporting systems. So we need to transform the dynamics. As well as the goal, we need new dynamics. And there's just two dynamics I'm going to share here, the two big ones. We've inherited degenerative designs, industries that just take us materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And that's what made a lot of 20th century profit. And it's also what's driven us over planetary boundaries. <laughs> We need to become regenerative, circular, cyclical by design. A, cute, a couple of examples just, just from the world of construction. The best buildings are the ones that already exist, as many architects will tell you. We need to do retrofit and restoration, not knock down and build again. Work with the materials that are already there. Preserve. By the way, it creates more jobs and uses less energy and less materials. In Amsterdam, there's a district where all the new buildings that are being put up have to be made with circular materials, which means they have a passport of what they can be used for next. They can't be glued and cemented together. They can only be clipped and bolted together so they can be unclipped and unbolted. So it's a, literally an architectural design change enables that circularity. Passive house in New York and many, many places, but on a big scale here, this is social housing in New York and the sponge city in Kunli in China, recognizing that every place is embedded in nature. So nature's bringing her water and it's gonna flood have a sponge city that absorbs that rather than tries to block it out and then gets overwhelmed by it. So designing with and around the ecosystems of place. So regenerative design, and I'm just showing construction, but you can think of it in terms of food and ha you know, uh, electronics and clothing and every product line. But we've also inherited deeply divisive economies that capture value and opportunity in the hands of a few through privilege, through inheritance, through regulation, through racism, through gender inequalities. We see the rise of a 1%, locally, nationally, globally. And we've absolutely no chance of getting into the donut in this state. You know, the richest 1% people own half the world's wealth. It's, it's just off the scale. It's just but that's where we are. And it's absolutely impossible. So we have to become far more distributive by design. And the way I've put it here is sharing opportunity and value that's created with all who co-create it. And that turns out to be the whole of society of who, who co-creates value in a place. So just, again, some examples from construction. In the city of Vienna, a very elegant European city, over 60% of residents there live in what we call social housing. It's normal, central, affordable. It's owned by the state. It's owned by the city or city-run co-ops. Because 100 years ago, Vienna decided that housing is not a luxury investment asset for the wealthy. It's a human right for all. So they decided to own the stock of the city's housing in order to ensure it could be serving that purpose. Uh, in Chile, the architect Alejandro Aravena realized that many, many people would never be able to afford to buy their own house. But lots of people could afford to buy half a house. So he started designing half houses that have inside them, in that half, all the heating and the plumbing, electricity, everything that you need. You can buy the half house, and as you save up more money over the years, you can fill the other half in. And surely by changing the architectural design, he has opened up home ownership, home, home, home ownership to many, many, many people who would otherwise always have been stuck in the rental market. 
Community self-build in Lewisham, I was actually there yesterday. This is the first black-led community self-build in Nubia Way. People who were on the waiting list for housing, for social housing, and they said, I can never afford to buy a house, but I've got my time. They had to donate 24 hours a week of their time for two years, and they built these houses together and then get to live there for free because they've already invested their labor in it. And then in Cleveland, in Ohio, they are making sure that the jobs that go around retrofit and reconstruction and uh, solar energy go to people who have formerly been excluded from the trades and the skills so that they're creating new locally based high income jobs. These are just four examples, again, of many, many ways in which we can be more distributive by design in our economies, but that we can actually choose dis distribution as a design. It's, it's not uh, given. It's not a, inequality is not given. It's all due to the design and the law and the architecture of place. Okay, that's enough theory. Uh, that's just a couple of the ways, ways to think in donor economics. What's thrilled me over the last few years is that what we launched Donut Economics Action Lab because so many people from companies or communities or in schools or cities got in touch and said we want to do this here so I'm just going to show you okay it's all very nice ideas on the page yeah but what how do you actually do this so I'm going to give you one example from the world of cities we were approached um, very early on by mayors and councils can we can we can we can we do the donut here we want to live in the donut here in our town in our state in our village in our street so as a team we've created a downscaled tool a framework for really unrolling this literally so that you can use it locally so just as I present this I invite you to take your mind to somewhere that you know and love a place that you know and love so you can think about it through that lens so oh yeah before we go there we need this man <laughs> yes because Milton Freeman said only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change and when that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. He knew that because he, he seeded the idea of neoliberalism in the 1940s, and it took until 1980, Reagan and Thatcher in power. So they waited decades. We don't want to wait that long, but we're going to learn from Milton. We might as well learn something useful from him. Uh, we're going to learn from Milton, but, you know, see, why would you just leave them lying around, Milton? Why would you leave the ideas lying around? Let's have them up and running. So that when crisis occurs, they're not just lying around, in Hayek's books, in Margaret Thatcher's handbag, they say. Let's have them up and running in places that you can say, look, they're doing it here and there. So there's places that are pioneering it. And that's what we're doing in Donut Economics Action Lab, working with cities and communities that want to get ahead and do it so that there's proof of concept in practice. So when crisis hit, you can turn to that. You probably notice I've given you lots of quotes from dead white men, so let's stop there and let's listen to Shirley Chisholm. She was the first black woman to be elected to the US House of Representatives. Fabulous quote. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And I think of Donut Economics Action Lab as a bit like that. It's kind of pop up and the mainstream economists still don't really want to know. Don't, many, some caveats, there are some exceptions, but many don't want to know. I'm not usually invited into economics departments, let's put it that way. <laughs> so we are a pop-up chair, and we work with all of those who want to sit, sit at our table and join us in this table and pop up. So what would it mean for a city to live in the donut, right? Think of a place. Uh, what would it mean to say we aim to live in that donut? Could, could we do that? How would we do that here? What, how would we know? So what we do, and we created this tool, we unroll the donut. Got to make some space between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. And there you can see a tiny question that's actually a really, really big question. So there it is. How can our city or town or district or neighborhood, state, become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? Big question. It's actually four questions. And we call these the four quadrants or the four lenses of the city portrait. On this side, we've got the local. And over here, we've got the global. Down here, we've got the social. And up there, we've got the ecological. So... I'm going to just run through them all for, okay? So let's start where most places start thinking about the people of this place. How can all the people of this place thrive? What would it mean for everybody here to be over that social foundation? And that's a conversation for every locality. It's going to look different in Dar es Salaam than in Stockholm because people have different cultures and histories and values. What does it mean for everybody here to live above that foundation? Who is still below it and how do we get them above it? Local social justice. Then let's go to the local ecological. How can our city be as generous as the wildland next door? This comes from the biomimicry thinker Janine Benyus, who's a huge inspiration to me. 
And if she were here, she'd say, London, take me to the wildland next door. I don't know where we'd actually go, but we'd go and try and find nature and thriving natural habitat. And she'd say, right, what is nature doing here? Nature has a genius in every place. Nature knows how to store carbon and uh, house biodiversity and cleanse the air and cool the air from the treetops to the forest floor. Nature creates conditions conducive to life everywhere. And this is how nature's doing it here, and we can take this as the aspiration for our city. Can our city store carbon rather than release it? Can our city store groundwater after a storm rather than have flash floods? Can our city cool the air on a hot day rather than have an urban heat island effect? How would we change the design so that we mimic nature's generosity? That's what this lens focuses on. So it's about local ecological qualities of place. Then let's, that, that's the local stuff. And if, if we only looked at that, people would say, oh, you know, Denmark's in the donut and Sweden's in the donut and Norway's in the donut because they're really good at this stuff. But they have not got that stuff sorted. So we need to take the global impacts into account as well. Everywhere is connected to the whole world, this room. We're connected to the Earth's materials. We're connected to people worldwide through what we're using right here. So how can we respect the health of the whole planet? This is the planetary boundaries now. How can we... You know, great education in central London, massive planetary impact because of the way we provision for our needs and wants. How do we come back within that red overshoot? This is where all high-income countries fall very short. How do we come back within that overshoot? And think of all the people who were connected to the laptops and the clothes and the machines and the carpets. Who made this stuff that we're wearing and using and eating? Were they paid a living wage? We depend upon their work for our lives. So... To global supply chains, who's impacted today by the lifestyles that we lead, who's, who's hit by climate impacts, what's the culture and policy of welcome to re towards refugees and towards those who come, and many, many other questions you could ask. What's a university's role in global solidarity in terms of building international connection and understanding so that we have solidarity and connection between us? So those are the four lenses. And we invite every city to make a self-portrait through these four lenses. So far, there's over 70 towns, cities, or local governments, let me say, whether it's a state-level government or a district or county or borough, that are using this frame. And these are all places that have come to us and said, given the transformation we want to make in the world, this looks like a really useful tool. And it's a, it's a lovely uh, way of working. We've never tried to persuade or convince or push anybody to use it because there's energy that comes from others and they own it and make it their own. So I'll just quickly show you some examples. So one of the most recent ones to be made is Glasgow, right? City of Glasgow said, we're gonna make a portrait of the city we want to be and they did a really participatory process. They've estimated their ecological overshoot. That's not a pretty thing. And I admire any council that is willing to publish that because that's not, you know, that's not hand clapping. That's not to be proud of. That's, this is where we are. We need to transform this. We need to come back within. So they've come up with their vision of the city that they want to be, looking at all four lenses. Cornwall said, for every infrastructural project we do, we're going to run it through our decision wheel. You can recognise that's the donut. And ask, is it having good social impact and how could we improve it? Is it bringing us within planetary boundaries? How can we improve it? So they're using it as a way of better designing their infrastructural projects. And they're measuring their change over time. And you can, I don't even have to tell you what that traffic light system means. You can read it. You know, imagine if Cornwall puts out a press release. Over the last year, Cornwall's GDP has risen by 1.3%. So what? I mean, we just have no idea whether that was cleaning up an oil spill off the Cornish coast or whether that was good jobs in local towns and villages. So the single metric of GDP is massively replaced by a multi-metric, multi a dashboard like this. In, in uh, Ipo in Malaysia, they have the ambition of being the first city in Asia to aim to live in the donut, so they've been exploring what that would mean to do in Ipo. Barcelona have done, you can see that's donut unrolled and they've quantified it all. Barcelona's a phenomenally ambitious city. What you're looking at there used to be a crossroad jam-packed with cars. They took the cars out, they put the commons in, they put ecology in, they're transforming their physical space to transforming how and who it's used by. And they're using the donut to think about creating a culture of sustainability there. Uh, the government of Bhutan got in touch and said, you know, of all the, all the ideas coming out of the Western economic mindset, the donut resonates most for us with our concept of gross national happiness. So we want to pursue gross national happiness in the donut and think about it in our design for the future of our capital city, Timpu. 
uh, who do we want to be? And they've created their own cartoons of the vision of what, would, what is a good life like in Timpu in 2047. So we've been working with them on that architectural plan. And then bringing it right back close to home in Birmingham. Amazing work by this organization, Civic Square. Uh, at the street level, they're saying, can we retrofit one street together? Can we engage community? Can everybody feel like they could be part of the economic conversation? So many people are intimidated by economics. How do we engage it in a way that everyone says, actually, this is my conversation. I belong in this and I have opinion in this. Uh, last one I'll show you is a design manual that we created together with an organization called Home.Earth. They, they do very ambitious ecological design construction, so social and ecological in Denmark, and they use the donut to create a template for saying, if we really were going to build or retrofit within planetary boundaries, what are the limits? And by the way, those limits are really tight. That's a really great handbook that we co-created together. Okay, if you're interested in any of those ideas, they're summed up in our, our publication about how cities are getting started. And this is, we're learning from them, so we don't tell them this is how to get started. We say, this is the tool. And we're learning back from them the different ways they're trying to start this because, of course, they're trying to... They're a city in a nation that's not transforming. It's still going for growth, 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 perhaps. So how do you start to be an island of change when you're surrounded by a sea of stasis? It's really challenging on these policymakers, and we work with them to at least build the solidarity in their networks of those who are trying to make change happen. So let me finish here. We started... seems a little while ago now. We started with the big picture of 20th century economics. And I really believe these ideas damage us and damage our prospects. And we, it should not be an option to choose to think differently. I believe we have a, a, a claim on ideas that serve our times, as Keynes said. So I would start here. Starting point, the economy is a subset of society and the living world, and all economic modelling should be in that context. That we recognise we are part of the web of life and utterly dependent upon it. And we are collaborative, reciprocal, pro-social creatures. We are the most pro-social of all mammals. The most pro-social mammal. How do, we, how do we build on that quality rather than undermine it by telling us, you know, be competitive, hard-edged, rational economic man? And we need a goal. And the donut's one vision of a goal. So what if this was just the starting point of all economics degrees? And I can't wait for the day when I present this and the economics students say, well, and? I mean, yeah. We already know that. Trouble is, that's not happening yet. So how and when do we change that? I'm working with the Rethinking Economics student movement to turn the core concepts of donor economics into a curriculum that we're going to post online in the Commons for any lecturer who wants to teach. A set of slides, resources, here you are, hand it over. It's for you to teach. And, of course, any student will be able to use it too. So we're trying to put all these ideas in the Commons to break down any barriers that there are, and there are, for academics to move into this kind of uh, teaching. So, let me stop there. Everything I shared is on our platform, donateconomics.org, and I really look forward to turning this into a conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, that was pretty much a thrilling experience. I forgot to mention that, I mean, as a student of economics, of course, my first impression, my first graphic was the supply and demand, but teaching uh, as a seminar leader in, during my PhD introduction to economics, I, it was the first time I came across the donut economics, so it's a starting, at least. Uh, my students from introduction to economics had the chance to have that in their first year of studies. We we'll go through a round of questions now. Um, if you could please raise your hands and see who would like to start. Um, can we start with her, or maybe? It's working. Please introduce your names and yeah, make make it quick you. questions. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I'm Jade. Over here. There you are. Um, I'm studying um, environment, politics, and development as a master's. Um, and I was just wanting to ask whether you have any opinions or thoughts on degrowth as a concept and whether it's compatible with the circular economy or a way of practicing, if the circular economy is a way of practicing degrowth. Um, yeah, that's a question. Thank you. Great. Do you want me to. Uh, uh, let's do a, a round of questions. Uh, I think you wanted to ask or. Okay. 
Um, how many people want to talk about degrowth? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm getting lost here, but yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about how do you create the kind of the political and cultural space to expand the commons? And given that, if you imagine the UK, the most, the biggest asset most people can dream to own is a house, and that kind of stands in political, I guess, kind of a contention with the commons itself. If you could introduce yourself. Yeah, oh, uh, my name's Harry. I Harry, brilliant, thank you, Harry. Sustainable development. Okay. Hello, my name is Oh Ryung Jin, and I'm, we're, I'm, I'm studying the development uh, humanitarianism. Uh, my question is the, um, the, on the divided role in different blocks of economy in the world. Sorry, say again. The, the what? The divided blocks yeah. of economy. For example, Westerns, like yeah. North America, they are more doing consumption and market or pressing monetary. And uh, West, like uh, emerging countries, including East Asia and East Europe, is more about manufacture. And a like uh, Africa and South America is more about producing primary resourcing produces, which is so called like comparative advantage. But actually, not so many people are benefiting it. Do you think uh, this red part of official happens because of maybe this fixed role of different blocks? Or, you know, like a Detroit city or Rust Belt in USA, they start feeling zero sum game and that we enter the more severe competitions because of this division. It's very much fixed then, then unless we don't create any market in the global south. Should we stop on these three questions? Uh, yeah. <coughs> okay. Great. So, I had a funny feeling people might want to talk about degrowth. <laughs> so, I don't know if it's cheating, but I just stuck some slides on the end because. <laughs> can I? Because I can tell. I can give you a better degrowth story if I. Yeah. Is that all right? <laughs> I thought I know it's going to come up. So, all right. Here we go. Da 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 da. Just click to them. Here we are. Right. I'm going to start here. So. Okay, actually, uh, not to put you on the spot, but actually to put you on the spot. How do you define degrowth? What's degrowth? Or does anybody want to define degrowth? Not your mic, though. <laughs> um, so I guess it's, um, there's like the metabolic rift that's happened. That's kind of like reducing our, how much we're consuming and the resources we're using um, and rebalancing that, um, yeah. And what did we reduce it? What, what, great. Resource consumption and growth, obviously, um, and GDP, well, GDP, not focusing on that. Okay, great, great. Okay, so let's start here. Um, and you didn't say, but I, in, in any particular part of the world? Uh, global North. Global North, okay, so let's go here, right. So let's work with this line. Something I think is really interesting to start with is to recognise that what these different views have in common, and it, let's see if this seems, does it feel counterintuitive? Green growthers and degrowthers and post growthers, when I speak to them, they all want the same thing at this point. They all want that direction. In fact, of, uh, many people who support degrowth, uh, many people who support green growth, and they don't know the definition of degrowth that you just gave, they go, oh, I want the same thing. And there's this real shock of like, hey, we're brothers up to this point. Uh, we all want the same thing. So where do these views come apart? And you just brought it in here. I think these views come apart. And it's something I get frustrated with. It's not in the definition of degrowth. Because degrowth is as you defined it. It's a planned reduction, the consumption or production of energy and resources, ne necessary consumption or production, to have a democratic return within planetary boundaries in a socially just way. Sounds very, very like getting into the donut to me. So... If, if that's the specific definition, getting into donut and degrowth are, I would say, the same thing there. Coming back within here. But where they come apart is their view about what's going to happen to GDP, as you mentioned. Right? That's the difference. Everybody wants the same thing. The difference is the view about what's going to happen to GDP at the same time. So let's just play with this a little bit. Okay, again. Let's say GDP is the black line going up and resource use has decoupled a little bit from it, right? And, and I'm saying resource use. You can think, let all resources, bring your own kind of resource, carbon, materials. If we're committed to coming back within planetary boundaries, 
which degrowth is committed to coming back within planetary boundaries. And this is the global north, this is high income countries, okay? So if we're saying we must reduce consumption or production so that we come back within planetary boundaries, this is what we're committed to. Then the question is, what do you think is the likely future for GDP as we make this decline of resource use? So here's some options. Do you think GDP can keep going up, continue growth? Now, I would say that is the green growth position. There's plenty of people who, for very good, understandable argument, I rec respect the argument they make. They would say, we, so many technologies we haven't invented, we haven't even started trying, we're, policies aren't even aligned, we're still subsidizing fossil fuels, we haven't actually got the policies in place yet, we haven't even tried. We could do this. Simon Sharp's written a really good book called Five Times Faster, which basically argues this, that we could go much faster in this direction. So he would say, yes, we can have continued growth and come back within planetary boundaries. Do you think GDP needs to flatten out? Okay, you know, UK's GDP, if we just stop growing now, we could sustain it and come back within planetary boundaries. Some people would say, yeah, we could do that. We can have a stationary GDP and come back within planetary boundaries. A lot of work to open up that space between, but maybe we can go there. I'd say degrowth says... Uh, so it's not in the definition, but many, many people who support degrowth say, and I believe we need to see GDP actually go down, at least for a phase, and then it can stabilise. So that's kind of, and it's planned, right? So that's the coming down. And other people might come along and say, well, you're all naive, because actually what's going to happen is we're going to try and go for growth, and it's going to collapse, and it'll be unplanned. A, a, a rejoinder to this would quite rightly be you're very unlikely to get back in planetary boundaries in that scenario. That's just really not a good scenario for anything. So then the question is, which one of these do we think is going to happen? And it comes down to decoupling. I'm going to go quickly on this one because this is the equipment, the conceptual equipment you need to engage with the decoupling debate. Do you think we can decouple or not? If GDP keeps going up like that, there are pathways of resource use. That's relative decoupling. We're more efficient in our use of carbon or materials, but they're both still increasing. So it's relative decoupling. And in terms of planetary boundary, it ain't good enough because it's still going up, even though it's more efficient. We only, want, when we get below the horizon, then we're into the land of absolute decoupling. And everybody should cheer for this because this is the beginning of all futures. We have to have absolute decoupling where resource use is absolutely going down while GDP is still going up. Some green growth would say, look, we have absolute decoupling. And many other people say, hang on, it's not nearly enough because we want to get back to planetary boundaries. It's not just going down. We need to come down within planetary boundaries. It needs to be sufficient absolute decoupling. And if I can just land this for you, if I said to Harry, Harry, we've got to, we, that we've got to get the last train home. It's going to leave in 10 minutes and we're only going to make it if we sprint. And Harry starts like, you know, running, slow jog. I'm like, you are not sprinting, mate. You are doing a slow jog. So basically what the, the government are doing, then many countries are like, look, we're decoupling. We're decoupling. Because it's only actually falling by about 1% or 2% per year. And it needs to be falling by 8 to 10% a year. So we are doing a, a carbon slow jog when we need to be doing a carbon sprint. And the point is you miss the train. It's not nearly fast enough. So we are not... So, so I, I'm not going to show you data right now. This is the only thing I'm showing you. We are nowhere close to sufficient absolute decoupling. So yes, there's a bit of absolute decoupling, but nowhere close to sufficient. And, then, and this, to me, is where the debate is. Can we go fast enough, or we can't go fast enough? And by the way, that evidence is only on carbon. If you want to talk about material footprint, we're still in the world of relative decoupling. Barely even started. So I want to take a quick poll of the room. So if we want to come back within planetary boundaries, let's see. Put your hand up if you think, and be brave. Let, if, uh, you think we could actually do it with continual growth? Put your hand up. Thank you, people, for putting your hand up because that, see, university is a place for debate, and there are so many views in the world, and we should. And, and there are some good reasons why people might think this. Okay, so some people, couple of people, putting their hand up. Thank you. Yes, a couple of people think we can do it. Great. These are great people to have a conversation with. Who thinks actually we need a stationary state? Okay, so we could have GDP as it is right now. And we could decouple, just keep it the same. Who thinks we need to see actually GDP go down? The UK's GDP go down. That's a lot of people. Really interesting. Okay. By the way, it's really big. And, and I'm with you, but I believe there's massive challenges to transforming an economy so that it, the GDP can go down without crashing 
for the worst of people. So it's not an easy future. It's a really rock and a hard place situation. I'm not going to go into it right now unless somebody says to me, come back and go into that. But how, all the ways we're locked into growth, that's a whole other big challenge. And that's where I think, that's why I say be agnostic about growth, meaning we've got to create economies that are no longer structurally dependent upon endless growth. And we have economies that need to grow. Whether or not it makes us thrive, we need to take that growth dependency out of our economies. Because even somebody who's avidly degrowth can't tell you should it go down by 1% or 2% or for how long and when we... We don't know. That's what I mean by being agnostic. We need to follow the planetary boundaries, not follow growth. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank Great, you. okay, pleasure. Um, Harry, on the you commons... Didn't ask, you didn't ask how many people think it's going to be an unplanned Oh, I collapse. didn't, did I? <laughs> Who thinks we're going to have an unplanned collapse? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So what, what the heck can we do? Because that's not going to go well for anybody, is it? That's really not going to go. What can we do to move us away, as Peter Victor would say, ecological economist, how can we go slower by design, not by disaster? Whether it's steady state, stationary state, or degrowth, planned reduction, how can we go slower by design, not by disaster? Okay, to Harry's question. Um, I have some slides on this. No, I don't. Don't worry. Um, on housing. So really nice point, like the, the biggest... The, the, the biggest asset most people can ever aspire to own is a house. There is, of course, community land trusts and community-owned housing. And I think, so I've been working a lot in the city of Amsterdam, and there's a rise of community-led initiatives. But you need enough people coming together, and you need, often need changes in the law to make it possible to get a community-based mortgage. So, off, so much economics is about changing the law to make it possible for these new legal forms to be made. And I also think it's about proof of concept. You know, if, we're not, if we've never seen it, you can't imagine, does it really work? It, should I really invest my savings there? But the more that these things become visible and normal, like I showed a picture of the community house in, in, in Amsterdam, that, that actually it can work and it's much... It's feminist, right? You can have communal housing that has shared spaces for raising our kids and we can dine together and it, so many benefits of not living do, 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 all in our segmented little lives. So... I think it's a really great place, actually, to rediscover the commons, yeah. as well as communal spaces. Yeah. Um, your question, Regine, um, on those overshoots on the donuts, on the national ones, yes, the world is massively divided, as everybody in this room knows, at least as well as me, into the kind of the service economies, the manufacturing economies, the primary production economies. But the red overshoot that I was showing is consumption-based. So it's drawing on the resources from around the world. And so it, I don't think it explains in that sense. It doesn't explain the level of overshoot. Certainly if you're a primary production country and you're told that's your comparative advantage, you are locked out of moving up into the high income levels that would enable you too to import that much stuff. But I, but I, I mean, it would be a great exercise to go back to um, that chart I showed, this one. Right, and, and, and really, you could do amazing conversation and visualization of the relation. You want to say, come on, go uh, ahead. Yeah. What I wanted to say is that if we don't uh, shift to this structure and this, there is a fixation always, then uh, if we reduce this consumption from global north, mm. then maybe they can be uh, depriving of this opportunity of uh, selling product from. Ah, got that one. Okay. So, they can be damaged right. because uh, if they have a like purchase power, they have market, they can uh, work be, be between them. But it's very much dependent of this consumption of uh, exporting. Got even, it. Yeah. Got it. So you might say, look, even though these countries are uh, being exploited by the global system, they are utterly dependent upon selling their grain or their their labor to the high consumers there. So without yeah. any change and we just uh, reduce this uh, degrowth and this consumption, of course it's not good for the earth, but maybe there is a, will be this impact, for example, Koto Divara, which is uh, producing 50% of uh, cacao, but if the price of uh, this uh, primary material goes down, then the whole of the economy are damaged. Yes, and that's, um, and so actually brought a really nice meaning to the reba rebalancing of demand in the world. So again, uh, the point I had about markets, markets serve those who can pay and the rest they ignore. And because the global north has the purchasing power, great, you know, the drawing of the world's resources here, and there's massive human need, but not purchasing power here. So how do we redistribute purchasing power to this part of the world? So that instead of north, south to north trade, you've got much more south-south regional trade 
and moving away from this center periphery economy so, that we've yeah, created. So if it's not a precondition of uh, reforming this total structure, then maybe they will, like, they will decide the effect of this. Yes, I, I think that's right. And that's actually why we can't just say reduce without undermining, right? So it's all interconnected. Thanks, that's a really, really good point. And it's one, one reason why some people argue the high-income countries need to keep growing because lower-income countries are dependent upon us. Well, it's like, well, let's, yeah, I, I would make the same face. Let's reduce that dependency <laughs> rather than say we must keep growing because they need us to grow. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. So I had a, well, my name is Myra, I'm studying environment and sustainable development, like Harry, and I had a question about the private sector, because obviously you said, like, there is massive consumption, and this is what is destroying the planet. So in terms of um, the private, you know, like the private sector, I wanted to ask, so how can, uh, how can businesses effectively incorporate environmental considerations into their decision-making process? L as like frameworks like CSR or ESG, do you think they work? Um, great question. Uh, and I just want to say at this point, there's, there's this is kind of... I'm, I also don't know, as everybody else, I just, want to, I just want to acknowledge the weirdness of... Everybody asks me a question and I have to have the answer. I don't, have, I don't know all the answers. Thank you for the question. I don't know the answers either. So I'm just going to share back what, what, what's in my mind, but we're all trying to figure this out together. I don't know. Uh, what we're doing with companies, so when companies come to us at Donut Economics Action Lab and they say, like, you know, like, this is a fair phone. Let's say fair phone gets in touch. We make this great phone. It's modular by design, so it's regenerative. We pay decent wage labors. We've chased out all child poverty and slavery from our supply chain. So this is a regenerative and distributive phone. Is this phone in the donut, for example, if they said that? We'd say, look, we don't really want to talk only about the design of the products you make. We want to talk about the design of your company itself. Because the design of your company will determine what you can do and, and be in the world. And there are five design traits of businesses. I don't have that slide here, but we'll just do it here. Five design traits that, and I'll say to you, anyone who, you know, when you graduate and you're going to go and work for a company or an organization or a university, I mean, every organization has a design. So these five design traits, I always say to the students I teach, like, be a, like a detective about it. You're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Does this organization have in its deep design the capacity to be part of transformation or not? Am I giving my energy, my creativity, my skills to an organization that just can't use them, can't let me unlock them? So five design traits. One, the purpose. What is the purpose of this organization? Why does this company or NGO or think tank or university or council exist? Why, what is it in service to in the world? Second, it's networks of relationship. How does it hold itself in relationship to its employees, to its customers, to its service providers, to its supply chain? What, what relationships is it let go of and what alliance is it building? Three, how is it governed? Who's in the room when decisions get made? Does in a company, right? So there's a company called Faith in Nature. It's a shampoo company. They always used to ask themselves rhetorically, what would nature do? What would nature do? And they said, you know what? Let's, let's just give nature a place in the board. So nature now is one of 11 directors of the company, held by an environmental lawyer who has equal voting rights to the others in the company. And, and also Faith in Nature say, we're the first company to have nature on the board, but we don't want to be the last. Again, they're doing this to demonstrate to other companies we can redesign the way we're governed to change the decisions that we make. So I would far rather a company that had nature on the board as an environmental law with decision-making power than say, oh, we do ESG, corporate social responsibility, you know, like structurally design it into your company. So we've got purpose, we've got networks, we've got governance. I call this corporate psychotherapy, so the deeper we go, the more profound it gets. So let's go down. Ownership. How is this company owned? Is it owned by a family for 300 years? Is it owned by shareholders, by venture capital? Is it owned by private equity? Is it owned by its employees? Is it owned by the state? These are all completely prevailing designs and ownership of companies today. And they all have huge consequences for the one that sits at the bottom, purpose, networks, governance, ownership, finance, right? Finance, because where is the money that drives this company coming from? Is it built only off sales? Is it venture capital? Is it share issue? 
Is it private equity investment? Because where that money's coming from, is it crowdfunding? Where that money's coming from totally determines what that money is expecting and demanding and what it will extract for the owners and what will be reinvested in the company. So classic design, you get uh, people setting up a, a really aspirational, I don't know, let's say Fairphone. If, I mean, if Fairphone had set themselves up and got this great product and along comes venture capital and says, we love it. It's such a good brand. <coughs> venture capital goes in. And then, I'm making this bit up, please don't tweet this, I'm making this bit up, okay? <laughs> Venture capital goes in, and then we say, well, I mean, it was really lovely in the early years that you did this really responsible stuff in supply chains, but come on, you're with the big boys now, you need to grow up. We want our 15 times return out in 10 years, so if you're going to hit our growth targets, you've got to just knock some corners off your cosy sustainability image. So the money will totally change the purpose. So you've got at the top purpose, and at the bottom finance, and these two are just often hugely in tension with each other, mediated by particularly governments and ownership. So every company that comes to us says, oh, we love the donut. We say, thank you. We're really glad you love the donut. We don't want to talk about your product. We want to talk about your deep design. And many big companies go, oh, thank you. <laughs> That's too challenging, and they go away. But actually, it's the small startups that say, no, we, we want to design great products, and we want to make sure we are designed in a way that means we can continue to pursue that goal. So that's how we engage with companies. And organizations, actually. And, I, you know, the deep design of an organization shapes what it can be and do in the world. Does that answer? Yes. Yeah. Okay, just... Uh, can I just add one thing? If, if that's really of interest, on our platform, on our website, Donut Design for Business is the name of the tool. My colleague Erinch Sahan explains it, sets it out, gives examples from companies. If anybody's really interested in that company story. Just, just everyone, just wait one second. Yeah. There's an announcement. Just before we go on through another round of questions, uh, Professor Christopher Kramer asked... For, for us to announce that there is a joint seminar series starting tomorrow at 3 p.m. for CODEF students, jointly organized and present with the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance at the University of Cape Town. So there are six seminars. Uh, emails did go to students, kicking off uh, with uh, him tomorrow uh, and Nimrod Zolk in Cape Town. They are in room 301. Uh, and the series is on structural change and economic development in Africa. So you're all invited to, to join this series tomorrow as well. Uh, but going back to another round of questions, let's try to take tomorrow at least three. 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 Yeah, <laughs> so we can, since you were holding the microphone a bit much longer. Um, hello, my name is Jamie. I'm an alumni. Um, I did the Environment, Politics and Development program. Um, in my research, I looked at overdeveloped countries and uh, historical conceptualizations of that. And I found that most overdeveloped countries are identified as countries that overconsume. Um, so I was wondering if you have any ideas for policies that should be implemented to help battle issues of overconsumption. Um, my name's Dan. I'm on the Energy and Climate Policy Master's Program. Um, my question's about here at SOAS. Uh, one of uh, probably by far the biggest contributions to emissions, carbon emissions, is all of the travel that we have, both academics going overseas for various reasons and overseas students coming here to study, all of which is for great purposes. And it's not obvious to see what the alternative is to flying for that, for at least some of that. Do you have any thoughts about how we should approach that problem and aim for net zero? Okay, one more. Um, you, you were going to do the question. Hi, um, I do econ here, and fully relate to you saying I don't want to identify myself as someone who does econ here. Uh, we <laughs> also, thank you for rethinking. We do rethinking economics at SOAS as well, and have been using your book for that. Um, but what happens with such student organizing is, and similarly to here, you were surprised that people raised their hand for uh, actual growth mindset. 
And so the people who kind of join those conversations are people who are called slightly already on the same page. And my question is, how and where do you have those conversations with people who actually disagree with you? And how do you kind of change those minds? Thank you. Great questions. Um, okay. Uh, Again, I don't know the answers, folks. I'm just having having a go, and you all probably have as good answers, to things to say as me on this. Um, Jamie, I've got a funny suspicion you've thought a lot more about this than me, and you've probably got an excellent. So I should just say, give us the policies. But uh, I, I like the way you call it over-consuming countries. Um, I, t- I, would, I tend to call them overshooting countries, um, but, but the same, maybe same, same, maybe same thing. But they're the red ones, right? They're, they're those guys, right? Would you say they are the, they're over-consuming if they're if they've got the red overshoot? That's almost yeah, different. I mostly found that overdeveloped countries are ones that are overconsuming. Yes. Are about yes, it. overdeveloped. Yeah, the thing about the overdeveloped, it's there's a lot of underdevelopment in them as well because there's huge social inequality in them. So if somebody who's living in poverty might say, "Hey, you're telling me I live in an overdeveloped place? It doesn't feel like that from where I am." So anyway, but it's it's that it's a it's a really good tension of trying to come up with new frames that that represent realities, complex realities, um, policies, what do we do? Do we, I mean, some, some responses to, if, if people are committed to green growth, some degrowth would say, fine, let's just, if you really think the growth will come, let's just cap, cap resource use. So actually it's become, it's very politically charged though. In the Netherlands, there's a nitrogen ceiling. I don't know if you've been in, in the, the European Commission said, hey, in the Netherlands, you're using too much nitrogen, you need to reduce it. So because they're regulated by Europe, it, that's been imposed, this nitrogen ceiling, I was fascinated when I heard that because it's, we've all got quite used to talking about carbon footprints. And it was the first time I'd really heard someone talking about just a different like nitrogen ceiling. Who 20 years ago would have thought we'd, that would be a political thing? But the politics of it is they immediately got the election of the farmers, the creation and the election of farmers. So it's very charged. And as one friend of mine in Europe said, this is what happens when, when we leave issues so late that in order to respond to them, it's quite uh, drastic. It becomes socially unacceptable, and you get a, a, a democratic revolt against the drasticness of these policies. So that, that just says, we, we wish we didn't have to start from here. We wish we'd started in the 1970s, when limits to growth had said, we think this might be a thing. Um, can you edit out? What do we edit out? Paris just edited out, well, Paris is partly editing out SUVs. Yesterday, Paris voted to charge, what, three times more parking for SUVs? So there's the editing out of things. You can also infrastructurally edit cars out with bike lanes. So changing infrastructure so that people just choose. The, the, the easiest thing to do is take public transport and bike and not drive. Uh, edit out private jets. But edit in public transport. Go on. Give, give, us, give us two because you, I know you've thought about this more than me. Go on. Um, give us two. Well, one I thought of. Yep. The people aren't as yep. driven to commit yep. it. Like cities like Basel have done that. There's no app. You go there and it's like, what? There's something different here. What is it? What is it? There's no apps. You're just not bombarded. But also, just you talked about the psychological. I'm really struck that in France, the word sobriety is a thing, right? So, English translation, sobriety. Now, in English, what does this tell you about the English? That when we say sobriety, it means I don't drink alcohol. <laughs> but in France, it's come to mean a kind of Dignified frugality, sufficiency, moderate. And I hear politicians talking about sobriety. In France, like, our politicians are like, growth, growth, growth. And in France, they're like, sobriety, let's have some elegance here, you know. Or in Sweden, there's a word, la gomme, which means it's plenty and it's enough. And how do we find, the, and we need this kind of, I think psychologically, we need this aspiration. Actually, it's a, a, a good frugality, that we, a sufficiency that we, that we learn. Um, to Dan's question about travel, whoo, big one, especially because we want the international solidarity of international students. I mean, how much richer is, a, is an educational experience when we are bringing experience from all over the world? Um, I'm going to focus on the academic travel point of it, and I, I, think, I think there's just far too much, I pers- this is a total personal view, I think there's far too much travel. By, and, 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 if we, and I think it also if people come to a country, how often do you think you're going to pop home again in between? I think we all need to be more sobriety in our international travel um, expectations. Uh, this is real in my life. I married, by mistake, I married an Australian. 
He'd lost his accent, and it was too late. I'd fallen in love when I realised, oh, my God, you're from the other So it's real, right? It's, I bet it's a big moral and ethical issue in many people's lives. Do you, do you fly home for your brother's wedding on the other side of the world? Do you fly again for your aunt's funeral? Do you go for Thanksgiving? And how do, how do we hold social relations? It's, it's got massive moral carbon ethical issues. It's really hard. But I personally have... Almost, I'm going to say, almost completely stopped flying. I don't fly. I don't fly. I don't fly on for, for. Well, I went to see my father-in-law in Australia while he's still alive. I decided now, you know, I, I won't fly home for his funeral. I, I decided to go now with my children while he's alive. We'll be there, but we we're not going there again. And I don't fly for work. Um, and I've made that choice. And for me, how do we do make it work? I just think we have to be really great on Zoom. Like, I'm here because my parents live in London and they're not very well, so I, yep, I'll come to London, but I would not have come if, if this had been in another country and I had to fly there or I'd take a train. And you're taking the train is really good. You think, do I want to spend two days on the train to Stockholm? Is it worth it? And then you decide it's worth it and you do it. But I just think we have to learn to be great on Zoom because it's amazing we have this technology. So we just have to make it work online. Hello to the people online. Uh, we have to make it work online. Uh, we just have to travel a lot less. That's my answer on that one. Um, on rethinking. Uh, and you said, how do, yeah, yeah, thank you to the people who put up their hand when I said, do you think, uh, you know, endless growth? Because actually it's harder to hold opinions that a lot of people, you know, a lot of people in the room are challenging. And I think it's really important, as you said, not only to be in our own little bubble of people who already agree with us. So... Um, I teach in the in School of Geography in Oxford, and actually I started just doing a, a series of s sessions called We Respectfully Disagree. So I had Jason Hickel arguing for degrowth in collaboration or in, in debate with Sam Fankhauser, who was arguing for green growth, and I was moderating it. And as a woman, I, don't, I won't lightly accept to be the female chair of two men in debate. So I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a very adic, ac, ad, um, active moderator here. I really, and I, would, I invited them, and I said to them beforehand, I'm going to ask you, what do you most appreciate about the other one's position? Where are the edges of your own certainty? What would it take to make you change your mind? And, it, and I respect people who are willing to do that because often, actually, they, they're so entrenched in the debate. They are, I just want to win. I just want to win. And we can all watch brilliant rhetoric, but actually everybody should have uncertainty the edge of their mind or realize what it would take to make them change their view. We did another one on pricing nature with Bob Costanza. Should we put a price on nature? And Eric gomez Bagathan, no, we definitely shouldn't. And because universities should be a place exactly where we respectfully disagree. Like, what an amazing privilege to respectfully disagree with each other. It's fascinating you think that. Is it an emotional difference? Is it a statistical? Are you looking at different data from me? What would it, make, what would it take to make me change my mind? So maybe we think economics could hold debates based on re we respectfully disagree. I think it's... I, in fact, I, I said to the, the guy who runs TED... Very nice, very great man who I really like and admire. But it's like, there's enough TED Talks in the world. Somebody's standing there, I think this. Well, shouldn't we have more spaces where you invite two well-known people who respectfully disagree and we'd all be really fascinated to understand if they would be vulnerable enough to show the edges of their own certainty. And let's hope they're still there. As the slam poet Taylor Marley said, changing your mind is one of the best ways of knowing whether or not you still have one. <laughs> So in that spirit, we should do a lot more respect for disagreement. So, are there any questions? Um, um, my name is Tani. I'm a master's student at the DPU. I study along with them environment and sustainable development. Um, so I'm interested in pedagogy. So a lot of this seems to be in, like kind of premised on shifting the collective consciousness and a bit in tune with like political ecological ideas. So what do you personally see as being the most powerful pedagogical strategies that could be implemented to begin changing sort of how people perceive themselves in relation to nature, so mending this society-nature rift? And then secondary to that is, since a lot of this sort of knowledge co-production is already happening like very powerfully at the community level, does donut economics prioritize implementing this like knowledge production specifically from folks that are at the margins. Great 
Um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Cynthia, and I study Environment and Development at the LSE. Um, so I just want to know that is do you do you do you have any experience or is there any prescription or strategy to integrate the donut to the currently established uh, model pathways or scenarios from the IPCC, which actually significantly inform policymakers around the world about our environmental policy, for example, and because there are a lot of measures um, for for instance carbon budget, um, decarbonization, and fossil fuel. A phase out, for instance, there are very, very highly <coughs> according to GDP, according to growth, and uh, so on. So, um, does the um, the action lab also um, focus on this, or what? What is the experience, and um, how do you integrate this into like a larger um, policy models? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Franklin. I, I study nothing. Um, <laughs> is it naive uh, to think that somehow population growth could impact this? I was looking at your GDP graphs, and it, it struck me that they're not normalized metrics, right? If we were to reframe them in terms of per capita GDP, perhaps, um, uh, would that could the problem that we're facing be solved by by population shrinkage? Um, or is that just wishful thinking that the system will somehow adapt? Which one? Which ones were you saying weren't weren't population? Weren't, wasn't per capita? Which graph were you? Ah, uh, the GDP graph. I took that to be in just aggregate GDP. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I asked myself, you know, what if this was, pop? You know, I, I wondered because I don't know. Over history, has 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 per capita GDP stagnated, or is is it as you know uh, exponential as as GDP? And could we not? You know, will the system heal through, you know, just not growing anymore? In fact, possibly shrinking. And are we beginning to see that? Send it back. <laughs> There's one, one more here. It might be the last round. I think. Are there any, any others? Very quick. What? Um, I'm Majid and I study international relations and economics and my question is in regards to the relationship between local donor economies or donor societies and their either adjusting to um, other societies that don't have those ambitions, or other parts of society that don't have those ambitions or those um, targets or those measures um, and their relationship towards like more like, uh, like a peaceful and just society. So um, one example might be if the Netherlands, the, the, the Dutch government, um, for example, if they run the numbers, and they said that um, because if we were to cut out all fertilizers uh, or damaging fertilizers, and we were just to like, and uh, other societies and other countries weren't going to reduce it nearly as much, we could have we could maintain our food security in a locally sustainable manner. But that requires us to not take in any immigration, for example, something like that. That, that was really clear. And just and now say the question again. That, that was um, really clear. The relationship also. between like local uh, donor economies and their either lobbying other um, governments or jurisdictions for increased like environmental um, justice. Mm. Um, yes, we have four now. Tell you, Miss Celeste, famous with a tough question. Yeah, great questions. Um, okay, let's try. Um, Tani, your question about pedagogy. Great. Yeah, I really, really appreciate that question. And you said specifically, how can we change the way we people perceive the relation between humans and nature? Um, so there's 
a quote from Hannah Arendt that I really like. She said, um, a stray dog has a far greater chance of surviving if it's given a name. And I think in economics, we have treated nature and the living world as a stray dog. I mean, it was the little red wedge. It was, it was kind of practically missing in those diagrams. It was just sort of a little externality. So how do we name it? How do we bring it back? And what I've shown is examples of diagrams. So I showed... No, go back. Um, yeah. So here, the living world is not treated as a stray dog. The living world is treated as our mother. So that's a visual reframing. But then there's also a verbal reframing. So I sometimes say, you know, tell me how you talk about the environment and I'll tell you what your job is. Um, and actually, even if you think about the word the environment, it comes from French, environ, surrounding. So right now, our environment are the walls of this room. And there's nothing living in the, the, the language of environment. So I don't talk about the environment. So when, when I see a course that's called the economics of the environment, it, it puts the he heebie-jeebies in me in lots of ways. It's like, it's not the environment. It's not the economics of the environment. It's like, oh, now let's apply economics to the environment. The environment is that in which the economy exists. So we need massive reframing. Um, so playing with Hannah Arendt's example, if you find a stray dog and we say, let's give this dog a name, right? It's going to really matter whether we call that dog scamp or champ. I've totally reframed the dog in your head. Just because a name makes a difference. So when we can say, right, we're going to name the environment, but are we going to call it natural capital and ecosystem services? We're naming it. And we're naming it in the land. Now, and, you know, if I say, okay, you, you talk about natural capital and ecosystem services, I bet you're facing policymakers today. You're trying to embed this in very mainstream economic analysis because you're trying to talk in the language of power of today's power holders. But the danger, of the, and, I, and I respect and understand why people do that, but the danger, of course, is that we hand it over. Here you are, I've given you, it's just natural capital and ecosystem services, and now it goes into your calculations and you'll come out with a number. And we don't need to protest outside, we don't need to write poems and sing songs and, because it's in the calculations. Or, at the other end of the spectrum, do you talk about Mother Nature, Pachamama, Gaia, the living world? And if you're there... You're not trying to change this incremental policy and get into this document. You are trying to change the whole worldview and you're going for the long. And you'll have less immediate impact on today's policymakers. But we need that too. And so there's that spectrum. And, and coming back to the point uh, you were making about working with those we disagree with, there's actually often a lot of disagreement along that line, people shouting at each other along the line because those speaking of Gaia say... And I, I'll do this too. Like, why are you calling it natural capital and ecosystem services? Well, because they're trying to make it happen right now today. So I think there's, it's really useful to recognize what's the language we use and the diagrams we draw, and that shapes the kinds of policies we come with. Do you say, oh, we need natural capital accounting, and we need um, biodiversity net gain markets, or actually do we need a cap on and quotas on ecological resources and we need ecologists in the room rather than economists in the room so I'm with you that the, the pedagogy of, of, of the words we use and the pictures we draw I think it's massive it just shapes everything that follows um, and that's why I, I showed the portrait of humanity are we at the top of a pyramid or actually are we embedded in a web and that 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 reshapes everything and how and you know the exciting work I think and it's big work is Okay, and then what is the economic tool we use instead of cost-benefit analysis, instead of ecosystem services pricing? Then, then what do we do instead? And, and because that work is still nascent, it's very easy for people who are just trying to get stuff done today to turn back to the other stuff that already fits with mainstream power. That's where it sits for me. The other question you asked me was about um, don't, putting don't eat economics into practice and therefore do we focus on working with those at the margins? So... We focus on, and one of our first principles was we, we go where the energy is. We work with those who want to do it. So, like I said, we've never pushed and tried to, because there's enough ideas in the world. And I don't want to be a, like a carpet salesman, you know, pushy, pushy. is just, just doesn't feel good. But it's when people get in touch. Now, of course, some people have much 
more resource to get in touch or that they'll come across it in the first place. So there's an inequality of who finds these things. We work with everybody who gets in touch with us and we put all of our resources in the commons so we don't have any market-based relationships so that they're online and available and we're translating them into more languages and we're thinking very hard, how do we make this more accessible to more people? How can we bring in more examples from around the world? So it's very intentional that I bring in examples from Ipoh in Malaysia and Bhutan as well as Barcelona and, you know, so that, we, so that people might say, oh, that's happening there as well as here. And there's nothing like peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. I mean, over the five years I've been doing this, mm -hmm. the biggest momentum for change comes from peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. So when the city of Amsterdam first decided to launch its city portrait in the middle of COVID and the vice mayor of Amsterdam said, yeah, we're using the donut. Even, her say, even the mayor saying donut. I, I still think it's really funny. I, I, can't, I can't believe this happened. I only called it Donut because it was just like a silly joke on the side. Oh, my God, what have I done? Um, but when she said, yeah, we're using the Donut to reimagine the future of Amsterdam because this is the city we want to be. Six weeks later, Copenhagen, you know, we're like Amsterdam. We're... Copenhagen had a vote in the city council, massive majority vote to explore what it would mean for Copenhagen to live in the Donut. I have zero doubt that happened because of Amsterdam. And then when Copenhagen's doing it, and Barcelona's doing it, and Glasgow's doing it, and then the European Commission is like, what's going on? Some of our biggest cities are doing the donut, what? And, and it, so it's that, that that, to me, is the most powerful for momen momentum for change. And therefore, showing that it's also happening in Civic Square in Birmingham, in Ipoh, in communities actually that aren't resourced like those European cities, it's incredibly important. And we're working on always trying to find, how can, we, how can you do this without resource, without money? What if you don't have the data? How can you run a workshop if you don't have the money to buy toys and things? How can you just do it with your hands? Um, how can we learn back from those places? So some students in, uh, in Uganda said there, aren't, there isn't any data here. We can't measure the portrait with data. There's no numbers locally, but we can take photographs of reality. And so they started documenting it through images. This is the state of housing. This is the state of sewage. This is the st and I just thought that was brilliant, that, they, that this is what we can do, and this is how we can document. And then, of course, that'll inspire many others. Oh, we can do it like that. So we love learning back from places of, and, and communities that say this is, this is what makes sense for us. We want to amplify that back out. And if you have any suggestions and feedback for me, I'll chat to me afterwards. I'd love to hear. That'd be great. Um, Cynthia, um, are we getting done economics into the IPCC? I'll give a, a short answer on this, but I think it's a really important question. My understanding is that, and, and actually the degrowth community have been really good, and Jason Hickel's been really on it, that IPCC scenarios, they're all growth-based, right? And so even when we say this is science, yeah, but science is so circumscribed by economics. When Nicholas Stern, back in 2006, came out with his landmark report on the economics of climate change, his, his claim of how much we needed to reduce carbon emissions was because he said we've never had an economy that could grow with more than a dramatic reduction. That's so growth, the demand for growth silently sits under even what scientists have been willing to set as a target. And so I think it's really important that we have ICC projection, IPCC projections and scenarios that actually let go of the presumption of growth, that actually follow the carbon science and then ask, what kind of economy would be compatible with delivering that? So there's a political containment of what's possible there, and I think that's a really important place that needs to change. I'd also say in our, in our team at Donut Economics Action Lab, we're currently 13 people, and we've just hired somebody to be our government and, policy, and, government and international institutions lead. So she'll work with national governments and international institutions like the World Bank, like the IMF, like the IPCC, they, and they invite us to give talks, which we do on Zoom, uh, they invite us to give talks, but we want somebody who can more actively say, okay, how can we really help these ideas land in those organizations? And every, every one of these organizations, there's a kind of the old guard, and then there's a young generation of, of people who are like, they're the revving for change inside, and you can tell the old guard, like, whoa, like if I, and I always do that voting on the different things, and you can tell the old guard, like, my goodness, so many of our young, young recruits have voted for degrowth. What are we going to do? It's like, it's in the house, people. It's in the house. You're going to have to deal with it. I love doing it in universities and economics departments and the old professors and the young graduates are like, degrowth. It's like, okay, it's in the room. It's not, I'm not saying this. It seems like you're saying this. You need to make this part of the curriculum. So that's where we're heading. Um, Franklin, uh, is it naive to ask about population? So let me just put the donut back up. Where is the old donut? There we are. Okay. 
So when I first drew the donuts, some people would say to me, you've missed, you should have put population in the foundation, which I don't agree with, but I, what I would agree with is that what is it that makes the space, this space between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling? Some people say, how do it, this, is, this is the existential donut question. How do you know it even exists? How do you know if we were actually met the basic needs of all people in the world? How do you know there would be any space between that and the, the ceiling? That's a real question. And I think it would be solved by people working, not, not on money basis, but on an energy basis. And people like Narasim Harau are doing calculations based on actually how much energy and materials is required for basic needs and how much pressure does that put on the planet. And, but let's think about what, what are the determinants of the thickness of the donut? So often people say population. For sure it matters. It matters whether we are 8 billion people or 10 billion or 12 billion or 20 billion of course, because the more people there are, the more resources it's going to require to ensure that no one is falling short. But if we're going to talk about total population, we have to talk, too, about distribution. As one analyst said, it's like two sides of a square. You can't, only, you can't measure you know, population and inequality. We need to talk about them both because in a world where the richest 1% own half of the world's wealth, the reason for the overshoot right now is not sheer numbers of people, it's extremes of inequality. So it's about reducing the overconsumption that uh, Jamie was talking about, the overconsuming countries. But it's also about technologies, how we transform water into irrigation. Do you kind of do it, you know, hose pipe everywhere really wastefully, or do you have drip irrigation? So changing the technologies. It's about how we govern ourselves. It's about what we aspire to. But let me come back to the population question. And thinking about growth curves, so population is not what keeps me awake at night, and here's why. Population is a, a biological function, and any ecologist or biologist will tell us that nature's growth curve is really well known. It goes like this. You grow, you go through a really steep growth phase, and then there comes a point where it curves and it plateaus. And that's exactly what the human population is doing. And it matters whether we plateau at 8 billion or 10 billion or will we reduce, go to 7 billion or 12. It matters where we plateau, so we need to help it plateau. But it is coming to a plateau. And the good news is we know more about plateauing population than definitely than, than other things. Empower women with birth control. <coughs> Invest in child survival so that kids actually survive to their fifth birthday. Girls' education. So essentially, get people out the hole of the donut. If people are no longer living in that shortfall, women are empowered to choose the size of their families and will choose to have smaller families. And the work of, um, I've gone black, Hans Rosling, right? He's done wonderful videos showing a generation after generation. You can just say to someone like me, born in the UK, if I could go back to my, my great-grandparents, they probably had seven brothers and sisters. And that transitions happen, and I have one sister, right? So uh, in, in every country in the world, we've gone from, like, there are seven of us. No, it comes down to there are around two of us. When families are no longer in that space of deprivation. So the best way to stabilize the world's population is to get everybody out the hole of the donut. That's my, my answer. So it, that'll come to stability. What does keep me awake at night is the growth curve, because on your point about increment, it's locked in to our economies that we want to grow, including on personal income, because it's been locked in as a social aspiration that my kids should have, go to a better school and have a bigger car and have a bigger house and we should fly further for our holidays. Isn't that what doing better is? And that's been locked in by a century of consumerism. So it's the growth of the economy that keeps me awake at night, not the growth of the population, but they all interact. And that segues really well, I think, to your question, uh, Majid, which if I'm understanding rightly, the, the, the view you put, I've heard people make this argument, um, sometimes in Australia uh, and Canada, which is, and that's just where I'm hearing it from, which is, we want to have a stationary state economy. Let's go to a stationary state economy, right? We want to do that stationary state thing. And we want to be ecological and live with the planet's means. So that means we need a stationary population. So that means we can't have any immigrants, sorry. Right, that, and that's the if that that's what you're, um, that's what I'm hearing from you, and it can very quickly get to no immigration, which means you get these islands of well, we're okay, we're a stable economy because we're keeping people out so that we can be stable here. Again, that is optimizing a subset of a much bigger world. 
we, we can't, it's not going to work that way. And there's a real danger that we have kind of fortress Europe, fortress Canada, we put up the walls and don't let anybody in because we want to be ecological and stable here, even though those countries are massively importing from around the world. So I, it, am I understanding that, that question correctly? Is that what you were, the example you were um, leaning towards? That was a more extreme example. Okay. But um, another like, I've heard it. Example. So like if country was to say, um, we're going to become environmentally sustainable, we're going to enlarge our parks, make trees everywhere, yep. and we're going to um, be like very yep. environmentally yep. sustainable. And then do, they, um, do you think they should adjust their measures to account for, say, Birmingham, more people from Birmingham uh, traveling to Covent Tree with cars and stuff? I'm, caught, I'm not quite following the Birmingham Coventry car travel, but let me, I think... So, you, so there are ways through design that we can accommodate large populations much more ecologically effectively. And to me, a lot of the design isn't actually going to come out of economics. It's going to come out of architecture and urban design. So if you take two cities, Atlanta, Georgia in the US, and Barcelona, they both have the same number of residents. But Barcelona um, is about as big as this piece of paper. And Atlanta is the size of the table because Barcelona is built in small, dense blocks where lots of people live in tight apartments. They don't have a garden. They don't have a tiny balcony because they have what George Monbiot has termed um, private sufficiency, but public luxury, big public spaces that are shared. Whereas in Atlanta and many, many U.S. cities, everybody has private luxury my house, my cars, my drive, my land. Private luxury, but you get public squalor because you get massive pollution and traffic jams. So I think a lot of the designs that are going to make it possible for large numbers of people to live well are going to come from redesigning the infrastructures and the foundations, but also back into the psychology of what is a sufficient home for me? How can we create places that offer private sufficiency but public luxury rather than the other way around? And in a far more equal society is far more likely to be willing to do that. If that touches on what you were saying. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Okay. People, I think because of time, uh, we've reached the end of our... Thank you so much. Sorry we couldn't accommodate all the questions. Many very important questions. But uh, yeah, hoping to see you all in the, our next seminar series. Thank you for the great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.